Okay, we are live. All so right. thank you, Kelsey Stevens, for joining me today. Uh, for all those that are on or following me, uh, you know, it's been a while since I've done one of these, so I'd like to get back in the rhythm again. Uh, and it's perfect to have Kelsey on today. She has 15 years of experience as a health actuary. Uh, she's actually a principal at Wakely Consulting Group, which is part of Health Management Associates. And I actually work at that company as well. So we're kind of two branches of that company. And I thought it would be uh, good to have a conversation today. So thanks for jumping on, Kelsey. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited. Was that a good introduction or do you have any other uh, background words to say? <laughs> no, I think that was great. Yeah, actually, I've been at Wakely for 10 years. So it is the, the biggest thing to say, for sure, that I'm a, a Wakely actuary. I've been in the healthcare space my whole 15 years, um, had an internship in retirement, but otherwise have been healthcare ever since. Very nice. Um, but, but yeah, I'm in Tampa, Tampa, Florida. So is that that's where you went to school then? Is that correct? In Florida? I did. Yes. I went to Florida State. So in Tallahassee, okay. um, North, North Florida. I always like to ask people what uh, was kind of the motivating factor to become an actuary. Like, did you know about that in school or was that something that you kind of learned later on? Yeah, I did know about it in school. So I feel like, and I'm curious if this is consistent with the folks you talk to, but I feel like generally there are a lot of people that were engineers first or they were math teachers first and then they stumbled into the career. And my story is actually more direct. I went to FSU. That's where I knew I wanted to go. And in, you know, kind of deciding what my major was going to be, even before starting, I talked to, you know, counselors there about options told them, hey, I like math, but I don't want to teach math. Um, no offense to you. I know you not, teach math. Not offended at all. <laughs> this, <laughs> and, was a, uh, this was a late career switch for me. So <laughs> uh, yeah, like what else is there to do for math people besides be an accountant or teach math and never had heard of it before then. And they said, well, there's this this math program that's, you know, businessy. You should consider it actuarial science. And so looked into it and I was like, all right, cool. Uh, a well-ranked career and takes a lot of steps to achieve it. I like steps and achievement. So I'm like, I can do that. There you go. Kind of decided you. right away. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's actually a little bit different than, uh, I'd say it's maybe half and half because a lot of people that I've talked to were more in, you know, math majors or studied statistics or economics or something, and then kind of found out about it later. Although right. I would say now it's it's a lot more common for people to major in actuarial science because it's becoming more popular at universities. Whereas, yeah. you know, it, I, even 10, 15, 20 years ago, it was around, but it wasn't quite as common. So, yeah, absolutely it's, true. It's yeah. interesting. Our, the actuarial program at Florida State is much larger than it was when I was there. So. Okay. Yeah, I believe that. Mm-hmm. Growing. Yeah, and where where I teach at uh, ASU, there was no actuarial program until about I think it was uh, I want to say it was ten years ago, or maybe even a little less than that. So yeah. it's it's yeah. really grown a lot. Yeah. Um. Awesome. But yeah, and then after Florida State, what like what was your first actuarial gig? Uh, what what kind of stuff did you work on? Yeah. So besides the internship, the first place I went for my you know real career, if you will was to Florida Blue, so health plan side. Um, It was in Jacksonville in North Florida. I was there for about five and a half years. I loved it. Um, I'm still very good friends with many of my colleagues from Florida Blue. Um, And, uh, you know, it was just time for me to move on, get closer to family, that sort of thing. But um, yeah, what did I work on? So they had, and I'm I'm sure they still do, but they had an actuarial rotation program so that was kind of cool because I got to do a lot of things right away, right? I worked um, in the small group space. I worked in the Medicare Advantage space. I did reserving for a year and I just jumped around a little bit to get exposure to all of their lines of business. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, and a quick pause. Uh, we have a few few people making comments on here. Joe Sadow says, woo. Hey, Joe, what's <laughs> up? Cassie Sutter has a happy face. What's up, Cassie? Ali <laughs> says hi. What's up, what's up Ali? Uh, I'd like to give little shout outs here. Um, Very cool. If anyone has questions, feel free to pop them in the chat and we'll, we'll do our best to answer those. Um, but yeah, I was going to ask you, so you kind of started out as a, a health actuary. 
uh, was there some motivation to go into the health field or was that just this, that happened to be the first job that you got? Yeah, no, that was intentional. So I guess my, my dad is also in the health field. So that was inspiring from the start. Um, he does like litigation consulting. Um, but I think generally I had a retirement internship and it just wasn't for me. I think it's great for some people, but I was looking for something that was a bit more dynamic. And as you know, like health's always in the news. It's always yes. a political topic. Everybody has health coverage that you know. So it's just like something relatable, something always changing, pretty dynamic. Um, so I don't know. Felt like in some stretch it was helping people. Um, and so just felt like a good fit for me. Yeah, that makes sense. It's just, it's interesting always hearing people's story because a lot of people, it's just like, okay, I had an internship in PNC or in health or in life and they just kind of stayed there. Yeah. Um, and I, I so happened to be in health and I did take a brief stint, uh, like a gig at a PNC company and it, it was cool too, but I would say I like health better. Um, yeah. And so I, I was glad I had that experience because it kind of validated that oh, this, you know, the healthcare field is a really interesting field. And like you said, always changing and so much going on. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't looked back. So on, on that note, if you were to describe to someone who had no idea what a health actuary was, if you could explain that in a few sentences, what, what would be, what would you say? Sure. Yeah. So I guess I would say it depends who you're working for, but in general, a health actuary assesses health risk, right? So what is the likelihood, you know, people always say, oh, I know what actuaries do, they predict when someone's going to die. Nope, that's life insurance, yep. right? So <laughs> what we do is we predict healthcare expenditures. So inpatient utilization stays, like how often will people be in the hospital? What, what will the cost be when they're in the hospital? How often will they have professional costs? What kind of drug spend will they have? And you know, so assessing total cost of care, I would say, is really the main thing we do. And the reason is to help either health plans or providers who are taking risk, you know, stay on top of the risk they're assuming and make sure that they can fulfill their duties to, to those members or patients, right? Definitely. So. That's great explanation. It's better than mine. I usually say I, I do some mix of finance and statistics and it's involved in healthcare. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So simpler. Yeah. I have a friend, a colleague actually here at Wakely who plays a game when he's at bars where someone will ask him what he does. He says he's an actuary and then they'll kind of nod like, oh yeah. And he's like, you heard of it? And I'm like, yeah. And then he'll say a story about like, yeah, I mean, it's essentially, you know, watching when meteors are getting too close to the earth. It's amazing. You know, how to deflect and they're always... And they nod saying, and they're like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm exactly. Gonna, I'm going to start doing that. Uh-huh. And he changes what, what it is um, quite regularly. But I remember that meteor one for sure. That is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so. so now that you're a, a principal at Wakely, do you feel like... Um, your daily tasks have shifted from being in the weeds more to being more client facing. And if, if that's the case, like, is it hard to kind of balance the two? Yep, definitely. It's been an evolving role since day one. Um, I find, yeah. So yeah, my role has changed a lot. I would say more client facing or more business development really. So it kind of shifts from the doing the analyst type tasks to managing clients and then to kind of selling and delegating. So I find that most of my time is developing business. So looking for opportunities to fill gaps out in the market um, to help groups that might not be getting group uh, help currently or to expand services to current clients to help them, you know, continue to fulfill their mission. So lots of business development, um, lots of travel, lots of, you know, that sort of work and then really just making sure that each client team is set up for success so that's that's the hardest part is i believe okay, something sold and now how do i staff the team and leave so that i can get the next one moving um that's the challenge for sure do you ever like go to a, a client meeting maybe you fly there you've never met this client before you're presenting this uh you know new project that they may 
you know, pay the consulting company for, and it's a big deal. Are you ever like super stressed or nervous when you just like walk in the door and you're getting ready to present something or you're even on zoom? Like, does that, does that ever freak you out? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you're not really prepared if you're not feeling nervous. It's a good thing. That's true. Um, so yeah, usually, usually I have a little bit of nerves. It's gotten a lot easier over time. And of course it's easier if it's a subject I'm super familiar with, but I've found a couple of tricks. One is if it's not a subject that I'm super familiar with, I always bring someone with me, right? Even if it's an analyst, Makes sense. Right? Yeah. I have someone yeah. that's dug into this data set in detail. So if the conversation starts to get really technical, really fast, I'll have someone there. Right. Um, and then another trick that I learned years ago is to ask questions or kind of like repeat someone's question back to me. So if you were to ask me a really hard question, then I would ask the question back. So you're asking me and kind of repeat it. And then every time I ask it, they start to expand a little bit more. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm asking that because three years ago this happened and then here's how our business changed. And so I'm really just looking to see, would you have a way to quantify that? And so now the question is much more clear to me. Number one, because I had more time, but two, it's just like human nature. When you ask something back, then they expand. Yeah. So things like that. That's um, a, that's a great trick to use. Uh, I, yeah. I still get nervous with, I was telling you that I, I teach at ASU and uh, I mean, this is actually going to be my first year where I'm fully teaching like a full load of classes there. Um, mm -hmm. And like every time I get nervous before teaching and then I get in my groove like five minutes in and I'm like, I love this. This is like, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not nervous at all, but yeah. I like, I think kind of deflecting to the students sometimes helps me where maybe I'll have them do introductions or have them get in groups and do something and then like my nerves kind of calm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah. 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 The person doing the learning is the person talking, right? That, so, it, it's true. Oh, no, that helps. it is very yeah. true. Yeah. So very would cool. you say like on that note, would you say that there's a big difference between consulting and working at a traditional insurance company? Like if, if someone's watching this and they kind of have no idea the difference in what we're talking about with this whole business development idea. Um, yeah. Like what, what's the difference? Yeah, I think there are big differences. And of course it depends on the person, but yeah, in general, right. If you work for an insurance company, then that is your sole principle, right? That's who you're working for that company. Right. And when you work at a consulting firm, you just work for lots of insurance companies or lots of doctors or whoever your clients are. So, um, yeah, I would say, you know, my interaction with health plan actuaries is not like, what you hear the stereotypical, like, oh, they can't talk to people, they're number crunchers. They're all really great people oriented folks, but they definitely don't have as much yeah, external pressure, right? Presentation, not as often. They do have to present to their board or senior leadership, that sort of thing, but um, probably not as frequent as for consultants. And the other thing is there's just less, a little bit less control over your day to day, right? Like you have sure. to take control, but if a client problem comes up today that needs to be solved tomorrow, then that's now your, your first focus. Um, so, you know, a little bit more, um, I guess, demanding, but can be controlled. I will say that for sure. So, and yeah. I feel like there's more variety because of the fact that you're working with a lot of different clients, a lot of different companies, yeah. whereas internally at an insurance company, it's like, that is the company you're working for. So, yeah. 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 And I, I do remember feeling like much deeper on certain topics when I was at um, a health plan. Uh, like you might do something every single time and know it like in and out. Whereas at a consulting firm, you might see that once in a project that's over in four weeks. Right. And then you're kind of moving on. So there's pros and cons to both. But yeah, you get exposure to a lot more just because different companies operate differently right. and have different problems. Right. So. Right. Right. So being at, at Wakely, part of HMA, what would you say are your, I mean, you, you do all sorts of stuff, but what would you say are your like top two or three specialties that, that you're really good at or that you work on? Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about the provider space because that's relevant right now. So I lead Wakely's provider practice. So what that means is, you know, doctors or physicians, hospitals, they're traditionally back in the day paid for every service they perform but as the healthcare world has started to evolve 
the way that they get paid has changed in many instances. And so a lot of times you'll hear value-based care or alternative payment models, value design, that sort of thing. Basically paying providers differently so that they can do what's best for their patients at that time, instead of what pays them the most, what procedure pays them the most, right? So I work with providers that are starting to enter that journey and I help them to understand what it like to operate like a health plan, right? How do you think like health plans think? What kind of data should you be looking at? How should you review it? You know, those types of things. So I'd say working with providers now is my specialty, but um, done a lot of Medicare Advantage pricing, um, you know, lots of more traditional work as well. Do you, f- do you feel like on that note, um, you know, 30, 40 years ago, providers were involved in much as much risk as they are today? And if so, did they just like not really know it as much, not have actuaries involved? Or do you think they're just involved in so much more risk today? And that's why actuaries are jumping in and getting involved. I think it's the latter for sure. So historically, there was no risk. They just got paid for everything they did, right? So if I run, I don't know, 10 CAT scans today and I admit 10 people today, then I get paid for every single one of those. And now it's more like at the extreme, here's a capitation amount. You get this amount no matter what services you do. So that's what I mean by at risk. So if you need to do too many, then you know you might lose money. But back in the day, there really weren't in any risk at all. Um, so I think you're right. That's been one contributor to the increase in our demand is just the so world's changing. You would say capitation and value-based care are very new developments in the scheme of things. Yeah, very new, maybe extreme. Uh, it's been around, um, but it's growing exponentially. Yep, that makes sense. So, yeah, much more popular now than years ago. What would you say is the uh, biggest challenge in your career? And then on the other side, not the challenges are bad, but like, what's the most uh, rewarding thing in your career? Good questions. Um, Challenge, I would say, I just feel like it's almost a challenge and a blessing, right? We're always busy, at least at Wakely, it feels like that. Yeah. Um, And so the, the challenge is how to keep everything moving and keep every client happy, keep every staff member developing, keep the business development happening, but also like feel sane, (laughs) right? Maintain sanity. Um, So you have to really learn to draw your own boundaries, whatever those look like. Otherwise you can get run to the ground. Um, And leadership here at Wakely and HMA in general are super supportive of you having a balanced life and all of that. So it's really on, on you. You have to draw your own boundaries. Um, I took Wednesday off to be home with my kids for the first day of school. That was important to me. It might not be important to everyone, but you just have to do it, right? Like whatever it is, that means something to you. So that's a a challenge. I say it's also a blessing because I like being busy. That's when I thrive. When there's a lot on my list, I get a lot more done. Um, So I think that's good too. Um, And most rewarding, I don't know, or was that the question, the best thing? Yeah, most rewarding or best thing. Um, yeah. What you enjoy I, the most, maybe. Yeah, I'd say I like um, helping others grow. So as a part of being involved in business development or growing new practices, you know, really what we're doing is providing new opportunities for other people to develop their career and to develop their own expertise. Right. So every time we can successfully pull in a client and hand it off to somebody, then now they have a new experience under their belt. Right. Um, so I think the mentoring aspect um, is probably the most fun, just helping I, other people grow. I believe that. Yeah. So on that mentoring note, for those that are either just barely starting their career or haven't started yet and they want to get into the actuarial profession, what would you say is the top skill kind of going into it, which may, may be different today than it was, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago? Yeah, good, good question skill. I don't know. Uh, Part of me wants to go towards the technical side, but I'm going to say maybe I won't because that's all teachable. Um, You know, it doesn't really matter if you're experienced in coding or Excel or anything else. I think you'll figure it out on the job. I would say probably work ethic, tenacity, endurance, something like that. Um, Just really 
committing and following through because you need to do that number one to get through the exams. Yep. Right. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, no, after that, it's just the skill that transfers into everything we do. Right. Um, so yeah, hard yeah. work probably. And that, I mean, that makes a lot of sense because a lot of technical stuff is teachable. That, that is one interesting thing uh, in the actual world profession. And I've had this conversation with a lot of people where, you know, there there is uh, the exam track and then there's actuarial work and there is a little bit of overlap. Um, but as we all know, kind of like with school, you learn a lot of stuff, then you don't end up using it. Um, same with the exam track. There's a ton yeah. of stuff that you learn. It's very theoretical. And it's yeah. like... How do you wow. feel? How do you feel about that disconnect? Um, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is like you think about the data science profession, right? They have no yeah. exam track, and they've taken off, you know. And and like a lot yeah. of people are very interested in that now. So if if you're talking to someone that's in Gen Z right now, and they're saying, yeah. "I lo I love data, I love math," like what's the motivation to go through this really hard exam track? Or to yeah. choose data science? I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. I don't think there's a right or wrong path, but I will say one thing that separates actuaries is just the fact that there is that rigorous professional entry process, if you will, kind of makes it almost like a, like a club, right? Like you, yep. there are certain things that, have to have an actuary no matter what. So for example, like certifying rates for a health plan, they're required to have an actuary. So even though that data scientist that sits next to them is just as smart, they can't do it, yes. right? And so yes. you are rewarded in kind of fighting through that process by having some of those opportunities. And then you have just other folks that have been through it and kind of understand, um, why you're asking the questions you're asking and why you're digging in when it might not seem necessary and um all of that so that's a yeah, great answer really that's it, very interesting that actually was similar to what the answer i had in my head was really supply and demand because yeah, you know yeah, when you get true. through those exams like you said there's certain things that only actuaries can sign off on and if you don't have very many of them uh, you know, and your supply is low and the demand is high, that is going, there's going to be some reward for that. So whereas a data yeah. scientist, that's a rewarding career as well. I'm not saying it's not, but um, it's just, there's a different side to it. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you can still work with data scientists as an actuary. We it's, have a whole no, it's very true. data science department yeah. at Wakely and we can interact with them. And, and now yeah. with the recent exams, there's a lot of data science in the exams. So <laughs> There you yeah. go. Yeah. Yeah. Thankfully I finished before that. There I'm I'm actually uh teaching the SRM course at ASU this semester, so statistics for risk modeling, which has oh, wow. a little bit of data science stuff in it, but it's kind of the precursor to the PA exam. And I, I didn't actually have to take SRM, but now I get to learn all the stuff so I can teach it. <laughs> so Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, um, you're right though. You definitely don't use any of that initial stuff. Like yeah. the your the students listening would probably laugh like I don't know how to do a derivative or an integral anymore like I just yeah, don't that's need it. I mean you don't don't use it you lose it that's that's like anything yeah. so yeah, yeah that's like, I know that I could figure it out if I needed to yep but of course I don't do it yeah. so have some late nights of watching YouTube videos on some calculus you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah yep. that's right do you do you think that artificial intelligence you know is being developed and theoretically, artificial intelligence can do most things that humans do. Do you think that it could ever replace what an actuary does? Or do you think that's nonsense and that would never happen? I don't think it'll ever happen, but I don't want you to watch this in 15 years and laugh. <laughs> so maybe it could happen. But um, yeah, I don't know. There's just too many things that you know, you don't expect like the COVID pandemic, right? right? Like there are things that you can't just use history and, and rely on that. And then all problems are solved. Um, so yeah, I think there's always going to need to be someone with the business knowledge to kind of supplement and guide the AI. It should definitely make a lot of processes easier right. um, or more automated and, and ideally 
allow people to spend their time on more innovative things, right? Yep. Uh, but yeah, I don't think it'll ever will ever go away. I don't know. I remember being asked that a lot in like when interviewing college students, or even like could a particular political um, you know decision change your opportunities for work? Like when the ACA was being passed, what might that do? Well to actuaries or what happens if there is Medicare for all, what will that do for actuaries or it doesn't matter. Whatever happens, there's going to be a need is kind of my thought. Um, yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I, I would say a more likely scenario would be the, the whole payment system changes. Like you're saying, maybe, maybe it's Medicare for all, maybe it's something completely different that we've never thought of. We're just so used to thinking about insurance, maybe like this new generation, will develop some new financial system but like i feel like there's always there's a skill set there that can be that can always be used and even if artificial intelligence replaces one aspect there's going to be other things yeah um, it'll for sure change when i started my career underwriting was allowed people could be denied coverage because they had a pre-existing condition mm-hmm. now that can't happen and so right. like things are different it's definitely not the same work at all but there's always work to be done so it's for sure yeah. So, so for someone that is looking at the profession, they're skeptical of the word corporate America, like but Gen Z. So what I've kind of heard is we're going into more of what they call a gig economy, where people are okay. taking gigs and they're, they're less oh. inclined to take a corporate job or they have the 401k, they have the good benefits, all that. Uh, a lot of people now are, you know, doing, it's kind of like Uber or uh, maybe they'll, maybe they're a programmer and they go take a project for someone and people are more inclined to do that now. Uh, what would you say to someone who is skeptical and has never experienced a corporate job, but they are really analytical and they, they've been interested in being an actuary? Uh, do you think that just has a stigma with the word corporate America? What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, probably, probably more so now. Um, but I mean, you can certainly have fun in, I guess, quote, corporate America, right? So I would say that I don't view any of those things as a barrier for me now, right? We have tons of flexibility. Um, We have, you know, the opportunity to take sabbatical or personal leaves if you just need a month off, Um, you know, so kind of a break for mental health, whatever. Um, We also have the opportunity to take our career in like whatever direction we want. So that's one thing that I love about Wakely. I'm sure other firms too, but for example, we invest in research. So if you have a, a great idea or something you you want to build or test or see if it would be helpful, Wakely will fund that. We'll you know, pay just like it was a client project. Um, you have to go through a process of kind of proving why you want to do it, laying out your, your use case and all of that. But once you get approved, you are kind of supported to go down unique paths that just seem fun for you. Um, and you can choose what kind of work you do too. If you're really interested in behavioral health work and not really interested in Medicare work or, you know, what, whatever it is, you can sort of drive your career in that direction. So it's not like, ah, I just got to do whatever this guy tells me for 30 years and then I'm done. So that's, yeah, that's a great answer. I mean, that's kind of what I would say too. I would say a big thing is where you work, not necessarily corporate America, because really everything's corporate, even the gig economy, everything comes down to a corporation. So it's yeah. like, but yeah. if you if you're working at a place that, you know, you like the people you work with and who you work right. for, it makes a massive difference. So right. Um, yeah, and you gotta make yeah. it fun. Right? Yeah, whatever you do, make it fun. I 100%. saw the video from your intern. Uh, that was awesome. <laughs> Shout out to the interns, Ali and Emma. That was, yes, we, we have, we, yes, we really enjoy our company culture and uh, they did a great job with that. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah I think we're, uh, we had a group battle back. I'm sure. They didn't win, but it, they tried. It was a good video. I saw it. Uh, I don't know if we need to vote on that or what we got to find out. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right. It's all about who you work with, which is why I've been here for 10 years. Right. When, when you like, you work with you can stay around for sure well it's kind of crazy like i uh i won't go into my whole story but i uh quit my job my whole plan was to to go to grad school and teach which i am now teaching but i i kind of was like just ready for a big change and 
I worked for some decent companies, but I never really like found that passion. And I now am at EHC, which is part of HMA. And yeah. it, it was just, it's a better fit for me than anywhere else I've, I've ever been. So yeah. I think it makes a massive difference um, where you're at. And I, I didn't think that I was going to be doing more actuarial work again, honestly. I thought I was just going to go into teaching and now here yeah. I am doing both. So <laughs> That's awesome. Best of both yeah. worlds. Right? Best, best of both worlds. Keeps you relevant. That's that's exactly it. That, that's the other thing is I, I feel like having one foot in industry, one foot in academia kind of keeps you grounded a little bit. Like they and try to kind of bring them together. So yeah. Yeah. That's um, great. That's awesome. We got we got a live comment from Ali, our intern, and he says, LOL, Emma, <laughs> Emma carried that dance. <laughs> uh, thought he did great too. Uh Ali, you did great. Um, so, okay, we're we're at about a little over 30 minutes here, so I wanted to kind of wrap it up, but on kind of the final note, away from the whole actuarial profession, what would you say is like your favorite pastime or hobby outside of work, and what is your favorite music? Oh. Um, Type of music, I should say. Yeah. So, pa favorite pastime... Honestly, I would say just hanging out with friends and family. So I'm, you know, from a town called Safety Harbor here outside of Tampa. I've got a ton of girlfriends in the Safety Harbor area who like to just go grab drinks at the local wine bar, go shop at the shops downtown, just hang out, um, boating with friends, that sort of thing. Um, I like to work out. I go to Burn Boot Camp. Shout out to Burn. Nice, nice. Um, Time with family, you know, just any time, really quality time is, is great. Um, music, I'm actually into country lately, which probably shocks you. Um, it, it actually, you're going to get uh, some cheers from people at our company. There, we, we have this, speaking of company culture, we have this weekly playlist thing where uh, a person has to create a playlist so that everyone can get a taste of like the music they like. And oh. about half of our company is really into country, so. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's just feel good, right? Good for the soul. Yeah. A little bit of chicken fry, that, that kind of thing. But that's, that's yeah, I, I'll go for anything besides, like, heavy metal. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I've never been into heavy metal either, although... I work out a lot, and recently there's been a few times where I listen to heavy metal. I'm like, oh, I can get like a oh, really yeah. solid, solid workout. In. <laughs> That's funny. Um, oh, okay, I got a got a live comment from Tyson. Long live the CVS days. Uh, he's referring to. I was talking about my previous jobs. No offense to CVS. I worked for CVS for a while. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> um, Tyson, it. thanks for the comment. Uh, I probably have some other CVS friends watching. Uh, I had some good times at CVS, so. Um, yeah, and here I am live talking about my previous previous jobs. Um, that's right. so stick with us. That's that's right. Uh, I think that was that was about it. I appreciate you jumping on, Kelsey, and yeah, was uh, that was a fun conversation. Let's see, do we have any other comments here? I'm looking through. I think I think we hit all the comments. So awesome. thanks thanks for joining, everyone. Um, Kelsey, I will let you get back to. Uh, any work things you got going on today, but happy Friday. Right. Have a good wrap weekend. Wrap up for Friday, yeah. That's that right. It was fun. Thanks for having me, and good luck to anyone pursuing an actuarial career. Definitely. Maybe stick to it. You can do hard things, right? You definitely can. Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> all right. We will see you all next time. All right. See ya.